we hope that you'll continue to enjoy your lunch, um, but we do have a, a more informal panel discussion. Um, perhaps a week where the financial markets have tumbled and the country faces a serious economic challenge is not the best week to discuss judicial salaries. Um, <laughs> But those salaries have, in real terms, in the case of federal judges, been cut in, in half. And this has created a challenge to the recruitment to the bench of talented judges uh, and retention of experienced judges on the bench. And since we're all concerned about the quality of our judges, we thought it might be interesting to hear from two individuals who have been deeply involved in efforts to secure a judicial salary restoration. Brock Hornsby, Brock Hornby is district judge for the District of Maine. He was a member of the Judicial Conduct and Disability Act Study Committee, also known as the Breyer Committee, uh, that studied and reported on judicial discipline for federal judges. In 2007, the Chief Justice of the United States, John Roberts, asked Judge Hornby to chair an ad hoc committee to secure judicial salary restoration. And it is this most recent assignment that he will report on to you today. Uh, Bernard Nussbaum is partner at Wachtell, Lipton, Rosen, and Katz. Among his many notable achievements has been service as counsel to the President of the United States during the Clinton administration and senior member of the House Judiciary Committee during the 1974 Watergate impeachment inquiry. He has been counsel to Chief Judge Judith Kaye in litigation to require an increase in judicial salaries in the state of New York after efforts to secure an, in an increase through the state legislature there failed. Both have insights on why it is important uh, to have fair judicial salaries and the status of efforts to obtain those salaries. Thank you. Judge Hornby. Good afternoon. Pay for judges. I can pretty much guarantee you this is not one of the topics that Governor Palin and Senator Biden are boning up on uh, in preparation for tonight's debate. It's always a difficult topic, and as Merle has suggested, it's particularly difficult when we're looking at an economic crisis and when people are looking at losing their homes by foreclosure. But I am going to talk about it because even in the best of boom times, Congress has failed to deal with the issue of judicial pay restoration. Here are the numbers. 1969 was the last time the federal judicial pay was set pursuant to a quadrennial commission. And from that date through 2006, when we last did the numbers, the real pay for federal judges declined about 25 percent, while the average real pay of American workers increased about 19 percent. The next and only other pay raise was in 1989 when Congress did elevate pay and took away most of judges' ability to have any outside income and promised COLAs for the future. Starting in 1993, judges have been denied COLAs in six out of the next 15 years, from 1993 through 2008, so not even COLAs during that time. The colas that federal judges do receive are basically diet colas. They're less than what the general schedule, the ordinary worker, gets. And alone among all federal employees, including Congress, judges cannot get a cola unless Congress first explicitly votes for it. Every other employee in Congress itself gets a cola unless Congress specifically votes against it. So what's been the result? Well, since 1993, most federal workers' pay has increased 61 percent by the use of COLAs. Inflation has gone up 36 percent, and federal judges' COLAs have increased only 24 percent. If we had just received the COLAs that the general schedule got since 1989, federal trial judges would now be earning 218,000, and still, and instead, they're earning 169,000 significantly less than what most of our law clerks make when they leave us after one year of clerking. So this conversation is not about keeping pace with lawyer salaries. It's not about keeping pace with school superintendent salaries. It's not about keeping pace with nonprofit salaries or what judges make in other law, common law countries. It's simply about simple fairness. And let me tell you what we have tried to do 
in the year and three quarters, I guess it is, since the Chief Justice appointed the committee. And what really started even before the committee is the Chief Justice in his year-end statement at the end of 2006 announced that judicial pay restoration was a critical preeminent priority that he had. And he encouraged and asked Jim Duff, the new director of the administrative office at that time, no longer new, who's over in the room here, to really take on an energized role in making sure that it happened. He then appointed an ad hoc committee that I'm chairing. And Jim Duff and his office and the ad hoc committee have undertaken the following things. I'll use the word we, but a lot of the time it means Jim Duff and people with him. First thing we did was to get White House support. The president supported any pay restoration that the Congress would approve. He did that back in early 2007, and he continued it as recently as a week or two ago with a letter to the leadership urging Congress to do judicial pay restoration before this Congress adjourned. The debate really kind of opened with uh, Chairman Volcker's op-ed in the Wall Street Journal back in February of 2007 where he ran some numbers saying that a federal judge had simply received the average American uh, worker pay increase since 1969, the pay now would be $261,300. Conversations in the Senate led to a bill being introduced by Senators Leahy and Hatch, quickly joined on by a lot of others, that requested an increase of 50 percent. Senator Leahy said the president had got a 100 percent increase about four years earlier, so it seemed fair to him the judges would get a 50 percent increase. In the House, Chairman Conyers uh, and a huge bevy of supporters signed legislation that would have given 233,000. Uh, that's basically an index number that would have resulted from running the COLAs through from 1969. During this time, support was organizing. There was a wonderful conference held at NYU Institute of Judicial Administration another comparable conference held at Hastings College of Law where all kinds of organizations assembled in support of federal judicial pay restoration. Out of that leadership, Russ Deo, uh, General Counsel Johnson & Johnson, Harvey Saverstein, a lawyer at Mintz Levin in Los Angeles, took on the role of organizing these. We ended up with support from bar associations all the way from the ABA on down, civil rights organizations of every sort, uh, Fortune 500 companies and their general counsel, the Business Roundtable, the Chamber of Commerce, every major labor organization, law school deans, environmental organizations, you name it, all there. As a result of Chairman Conyers' insistence that in the House the legislation be bipartisan, there was a lengthy discussion between Congressman Berman, the chair of the court subcommittee, and Lamar Smith, the ranking member, and Jim Duff was present there, that resulted in an adjustment to 218,000, which is what is in the bill now, uh, in terms of what the increase would be, which would take place uh, in terms of the, the index that they used. Also, some restrictions on retirement, delaying federal judges' retirement until age 67, requiring 17 years of service rather than the previous 15 years, somewhat of a penalty if judges left the bench entirely to earn outside income, there would be some proportional reduction of the retirement annuity if they did that. But the result was that it was voted out of the House Judiciary Committee overwhelmingly, unanimously by the Democrats, all but five Republicans voted in favor of, of, of the bill. We actually had some hope that we might get something through in 2007 before we got into an election year. Well, it didn't happen. And so in 2008, we were in the Senate Judiciary Committee seeking to get the, a bill voted out there. Senator Feinstein introduced a friendly amendment of the markup, which incorporated what was in the House. And then there were some other things added on. Senator Feingold, who had announced that he was going to oppose pay anyway, added some other amendments that had to do with restricting judges' travel, with restricting their attendance at seminars, a number of things. Unfortunately, that was a party-line vote and passed barely, but the whole package passed. A number of what would have been Republican supporters voted against it because of the additions that came in from Senator Feingold, not because they opposed pay restoration. We still had a solid vote, not as overwhelming as in the House. That was in the spring of this year. Since then, we've been working hard to try to get it attached to a piece of legislation. We've looked at every possible piece of moving legislation. There were three or four that seemed more promising than others. We thought we had it in the summer. Uh, we thought that at the end of session, it was going to happen. And you know what has happened. The economic crisis 
has really taken the wind out of our sails in terms of pay restoration happening before the election. Uh, there, we, we know that that's simply something we have to deal with as a matter of reality. But part of the question, too, is well, why didn't it happen earlier when we had other opportunities? And I think we have to say that there hasn't yet been enough political will to do that. What do I mean by that? Judicial pay isn't a great vote-getter. You don't go back to your hometown if you're a congressman or a senator and say, vote for me, I just voted to increase judges' pay. It's not a real rousing kind of a campaign challenge. And for that reason, very often congressional staff are resistant. They see it as all risk, no reward. It's so easy for outside forces to derail the, the legislation, the outside event. Judges don't have a natural lobby, as I'm sure you know. We can't contribute back money or raise money or do things of that sort. And last but certainly not least is the linkage issue. At this point, Congress's salary is the same as federal trial judges' salary. And there are members of Congress who are very reluctant to see that change. There are two basic reasons. One reason is that some members of Congress think the only hope they ever have of getting a pay increase is if they can ride the judge's coattails, that the case can be made that federal judges should get a pay raise so Congress should go along. We think that's been disproven. Uh, Brookings and AEI did a study. Russell Wheeler, one of the authors, is here in the room, that basically showed historically that's not been the case, that Congress has not succeeded by linkage. If anything, Congress has succeeded better when the judges go ahead and Congress, uh, Congress goes, uh, comes along later. But another reason, I think, has to do with the fact that we are a co-equal branch of government, gov government, and I think there are many in Congress who feel that it is not appropriate the judges who don't work any harder than they do, uh, who don't have any more expenses than they do, that why should those judges earn any more than Congress? And that's really been a significant problem in terms of the issue that confronts us. So, does it matter to you? You've heard a lot this morning, and I want to talk just about a little bit about that. Federal judges make a lot more than firefighters. They make a lot more than teachers. They're people who are very important to our country and our economy. So why does it matter? Now, let me be blunt. I'm afraid that the health of the independent third branch is in jeopardy. Its diversity, its reputation for independence. You heard the speakers this morning talk about what kind of law they can get in other, kinds of, in other countries, what kinds of treatment they get from the judiciary. You heard Dr. Greenspan talk about the importance of the Constitution and the rule of law. Let me just tell you some numbers. According to the Chief Justice's figure, figures and his graphs at the end of 2006 in that year-end report, about 65% of federal judges came from the practicing bar during the Eisenhower administration, and about 35% came from public service. Now, 60% come from the public sector, and only 40% come from private practice. I was just looking over the commission report for Canada that came out in May, where they pay their judges far higher, there they're getting 78% of their new judges from private practice for their statistics from 2004 to 2007. It does affect the composition of the, of, of, of the judiciary. Let me give you another figure. Since 1990, 130 judges have left the federal bench, 58 of those since 2000, 30 of them since 2005. Let's take that 30. Of that 30, 26 left for other employment. Seven went to jams, 10 went to private practice, two became corporate counsel, three took higher paying governmental positions, two went at a higher education, one took another federal position at an equal salary, and one went into a quasi-governmental institution. Judges are beginning to treat this as a stepping stone. It is no longer a lifetime career. It affects some parts of the country worse than others. The District of New Jersey has lost seven judges since 2000 to private practice. The Central District of California has lost six since 2000, two to the California courts that pay better than the federal courts pay, and four to JAMS. The District of Columbia has lost four since 2000, three of those to private practice. Minority and ethnic group lawyers come up and speak to me and to other judges to say that they have friends who have been vetted for nomination and then withdrawn because of the financial sacrifice that it would represent. 
We are affecting the pool of applicants in terms of who's available. Think about our bankruptcy courts. Bankruptcy judges make 92% of what a federal Article III judge. They make $155,000 plus some odd dollars. What do you think the cheapest lawyer in the Lehman Brothers bankruptcy proceeding is going to be earning? Far, far more than that. What do you think the opportunities are going to be for bankruptcy judges? Can you imagine in this financial crisis with these complex workouts the kind of offers that are going to be made to bankruptcy judges to ask them to come join these firms to assist in that? They have kids to put through college, just like you do, and there are going to be huge concerns that we will lose fine judges when that takes place. These are the kind of judges that you want to resolve your patent disputes, these complex intellectual property issues, your securities litigation, your contractual disputes, all these important issues that the speakers have talked about this morning. And so I suggest to you the question is really, as one of the speakers said toward the end, how much risk are we willing to take? Are we willing to risk the exodus that I'm afraid is on the horizon if we don't? Can we once we get over that tipping point. If this is such an important institution, as we've all said today, how much longer will we go? I know we're not going to get pay restoration before this Congress election. At the very least, they could make us like every other government employee and give us an automatic COLA like every other member of the bureaucracy and Congress itself. They could give us the same COLA, at least, as the general schedule gets. Back. We understand there might be a lame duck. If the economy gets better, we'll be back pressing for pay restoration, and we'll be back next year. There's no alternative, but I hope that some of you will take ownership of this, issue, of this issue and realize how important it is. Thank you very much. Thank you. I... I've been asked to come here to speak about judicial salaries and about New York. And Justice Breyer spoke a little last night and made a wonderful talk. Now Judge Hornsby spoke and made a wonderful talk. And some of the panelists spoke today about judicial salaries and made wonderful talks. So I guess that makes me feel like Zsa Zsa Gabor's ace husband. <laughs> I know what I'm supposed to do, but how do I make it interesting? <laughs> well, I'll try. I'll talk about what we're doing in New York, because we're, no we're no longer relying on the politicians in New York. We're no longer relying on the committees. We're no longer relying on the government. We're suing him. We're suing him. We're going right to the Constitution, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. There's certain basic have gone a decade without a raise, resulting in a significant real decline in judicial salary. The pay increase in 10 years. A federal judge without a pay increase. Not even, Judge Hornsby, a cost of living adjustment. No cost of living adjustment in New York in the last 10 years. Judicial salaries have declined approximately 37% in real terms since 1999. Other state employees, 195,000 of them, receive raises of more than 25 during that period, allowing them to stay basically even. New York State, which at one time ranked first in the country in judicial salaries, now ranks 49th in judicial pay when the state is living count. Can or not state behind us, by the way, is Hawaii. I think you have to do a quality of life index. So I think, <laughs> I, so I think we can plunge to 50 under, under my analysis here. Now, legislate, legislators whose salaries have also not been increased are sixth in the nation, New York legislators, when you take into account the cost of living. They're actually third when you take into dollars. And they can, and they do earn outside income, and they earn a lot of outside income. Outside income. Now, Chief Judge Chalk, who's leaving office at the end of December, your retirement age in New York, has been begging. Tacky, Governor Spitz, Governor Patterson, the leaders of the state senate. It's all the promise he has next year. We're going to do it. Right after the election, we're going to do it. So finally, in desperation, she went out to her and all the.
in New York, and we raise three constitutional claims. And I take these claims very seriously because I have a federal judge who's going to have to do the same thing. So I'll give you before I leave today. The first claim, and these are high claims. There's a combination to provide additional compensation. As the highest court of a sister state, Pennsylvania has said, he said it in 1972, it is the constitutional duty and obligation of the legislature in order to ensure the judicial branch of government provide compensation adequate in amount with the duties and responsibility of the judges involved to violates the very framework of our constitutional form of government. Why? The court asked. Because without adequate comp competent judicial system is not possible. Now, what does adequate mean? That it must be enough to ensure the public's right to a competent and independent judiciary, which means be enough to, to maintain, to attract and retain the most a Pennsylvania case. The United States Supreme Court expressed the same idea in a case called O'Donoghue, which involved a compensation clause. It said the Constitution protected a judge's punishment, not as a private grant, but as a limitation imposed in the public interest to ensure the independence of judges. The idea of 1933 was to attract, and I quote, good and competent people to the bench Independence of action and judgment to the maintenance of the principles of the Constitution and to the administration with respect to persons with equal concern for the poor and the rich. The Supreme Court about judicial compensation in 1933. The compensation must be sufficient for judges with a level of remuneration to their learning, experience, and the elevated position they occupy. You demonstrate judicial salaries are inadequate. Fire. Teachers make less. Well, the way you do it in New York, I argued, is you look to history and you look to history. What would judges pay to start? One quick snapshot. In 1909, a state Supreme Court justice level court in New York made $17,000. I know in nineteen oh nine made five. A state Supreme Court justice in New York, the trial judge in New York, made twenty five thousand. A United States District Judge made ten thousand dollars a year. The New York State judges are the equivalent of five hundred thousand dollars. Nineteen oh nine state Supreme Court who hasn't been raised in ten years. $6,700. That's what he makes. That's what he's made for the last 10 years. What we did in court, I didn't bring all my charts, which I spread out, and I would have done it today, except I up the whole thing. It showed inflation adjusted salaries using Court of Appeals judges. This is out in 1887. And we go up to today. Court of Appeals, Court of Appeals in New York. Less federal judges, the highest court in New York. The judge in 1987 was $10,000. That's $2,000 inflation adjusted. It remained that high. Then in the state constitution in 1894, for pay increases. And for 1890, 1894 to 1925, the New York state constitution forbid, for, forbid judicial pay increases. But salaries remain, nonetheless, pretty high. And finally, after the First World War, so what did New York State did then? It changed the Constitution immediately. In 1926, the, today the equivalent of $269,000. And it went up in 1933 because of $366,000. $266,000, $246,000, and then in the last 30 years, down. This is what, what you see here is 100 and, what, 1987 to 2008. 100, I guess, or more. And up, 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 down, down. In court.
That's history. How do you show, you argue to the judges, comparability? What are judges in other states paid? And I showed New York is 49th out of 50. What are paid? I showed they're paid 1,300. Actually, I was afraid they were going to be raised. My argument so you know, more difficult in court. At that point, I'm... We helped uh, you out. Right. <laughs> Two attorneys in public, in significant positions in public service. Let's get to private public service, sir. Yeah, I presented a chart. District attorneys, $190,000. The dean of the Buffalo Law School, $232,000. The dean of CUNY Law School, $1,000. Attorneys in the state controllers, $1,000. It goes on and on. Assessors, 50 employed by the state. Virtually any major position in the state makes more than, than a judge makes. Then, of course, uh, God, interesting. In 1999, again, there's a chart that shows the key state position. The judge made this, and all these key state positions were below a judge. Ten years later, these key state departments and agencies, 160 senior positions, they're all above. The judge's line stays the same. But every judge is now paid ten years ago. And then, of course, but I did this last. You know, I, I, I showed salaries in the nonprofit sector. The CEO of an average public library makes 600000 Director of the Brooklyn Museum, 6000 Go on and on and on. You, you get the idea of what I was trying to do here. I'm private practice. I finally went to private which is the easiest thing to do, obviously. Wanted to I really wanted to compare, not to the firm and other firms and some of the fancy lawyers in this room, but really I wanted to show what really government lawyers, public service lawyers, teachers, academics, nonprofit institutions. I president said 20 major with a total of 2,700 partners have profits per partner ranging from over $1 million to slightly under $5 million. And I showed average of firms of 10 or more Top 25% made an average $1,000. Even small firms, lawyers, made $220,000. See, as we all know, on the country, makes $160,000. A chart about courtroom salaries. Who made person in the courtroom? State court employees in the judicial system make more than the judges. Arguing that in the court because Chief Judge Kay didn't want to really get everybody too aggravated. The judges at the bottom of the scale, six seven. Attorney makes one hundred ninety. A major law firm plus a large firm partner makes three hundred thousand. Six hundred sixty. He's sitting there. He's deciding. In fact, when I argued this case, one of my associates was putting up the chart, and I couldn't resist saying, "Your Honor, he makes more money than you do." You know, and I, it was funny, but not funny. That was really it was tragic. That's what I was trying to basically bring home. Straighted, I hope, I think, the salaries are inadequate, or I tried. Now, the court also says that a legislature of the Pennsylvania has the power of life and death over and over the entire judicial system. The legislature can be compelled. This is judicial language. This is not the way you're talking. The so legislature can be compelled by the courts to provide money. Necessary of our courts, our entire judicial system could be a legislature mockery of our with his three equal, co-equal and then grant power and authority to set the salary co-equal form of government that's possessed to determine and compel payment of those sums of money and necessary to carry out responsibility he says this inherent power to ensure the proper Judiciary by ordering the executive branch to provide appropriate funds 
efficient and independent. I'm quoting a Pennsylvania court, courts actually, a number of judges. But this principle has been reiterated, but not only in Pennsylvania, but in Illinois, which is Washington, Colorado, I mean, judicial. Uh, so there's not strictly salary cases, some of them. All examples where the highest courts in those states redress constitutional violations by compelling the state to remit funds to the judiciary. My first argument is a constitutional right. Judges have a con- – the public has a constitutional right to have judges have adequate salaries. That was my first argument. My second claim, discrimination and the compensation clause. The compensation clause of the New York State Constitution states that a judge's salary should not be diminished during his or her term of office, same as the federal compensation clause. This this does not protect against declines from inflation if all are treated equally. A case called Atkins, which Justice Breyer was involved in as a lawyer, but I'll deal with that in a second. But But it does prohibit the diminishment of judicial salaries by inflation if judges are treated in a discriminatory manner. We have the compensation clause, and that really bars judges from being treated in a discriminatory manner. That is a teaching of a recent Supreme Court case penned by Justice Breyer, United States v. Hatta, 532 U.S. at 557. Now, what happened in Hatta? Congress imposed a Medicare tax in Hatta on all government employees, judges and everyone else. The court ruled that was attacked. He said you can't diminish the compensation of judges. Justice Breyer ruled for the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court said this is fine. This is non-discriminatory. Compensation clause does not protect judges from non-discriminatory taxes. If everyone's income is reduced, if all are treated equally, judges are not entitled to special treatment. But Congress also imposed a social security tax on all government employees, judges and everyone else. But it allowed virtually all federal employees, because of the nature of their retirement plan, which is uh, to the federal, to get out of paying the tax. They didn't have to pay it. They had a contributory retirement plan. But because of the nature of the judge's retirement plan, which is not contributory, it did not allow judges to opt out. The Supreme Court, by Justice Breyer, said that you can't do. That violates the compensation clause. Justice Breyer wrote, in our view, the clause does not prohibit Congress from imposing a non-discriminatory tax generally upon judges and other citizens, but it does prohibit taxation that singles out judges for specially unfavorable treatment. Inflation is a tax. But what about the fact that New York has the legislative salaries were also frozen for the last decade, and some commissions were also frozen. They also had to pay the inflation tax. That makes no difference under Hatter. In Hatter, the government pointed out the law disfavored not only judges, but also the President of the United States, and also certain legislative employees. The court, Justice Breyer, pointed out that legislative employees could join covered requirement plans and avoid paying the tax. Uh, And just like here, legislators can and do earn outside income. And with respect to the president, the court said it did not see why the fact that the president was in the same boat as judges should make a critical difference. Similarly, the fact that certain commissioners' salaries have been frozen should not make a critical difference. Neither the president nor the commissioners have lengthy tenure in offices, as do judges. The practical upshot, this is the words of Justice Breyer and Hatta, is that the law permitted nearly every current federal employee, but not federal judges, to avoid the newly imposed financial obligation. I said to the judge in New York, that's also the upshot here. The legislature has permitted nearly every state employee, all 195,000 of them, but not state judges, to avoid the financial impact of inflation. And that is why the compensation clause has been violated, relying on HADA. Third claim, last claim, linkage, which Judge Hornsby discussed. We claim to link judicial salaries, leg- executive legislature is unconstitutional. As we all know, executive branch officials do not, do not have lifetime jobs. Individuals in those positions have the option and the ability, which they often exercise, to step into a more lucrative world, including former White House counsel. Also, legislators can and do earn extra income while they're in office. None of this is true for judges. Linkage undermines the co-equal status of judiciary by making ju- judiciary dependent on legislative and executive decisions respecting their own compensation. If the branches are to be co-equal, one should not be dependent on the other. Linkage results in judiciary being tied to the political agenda of other branches. This violates separateness, independence, integrity. Linkage inevitably results in diminishment of judicial compensation and in discrimination against judges. There's no real case law on this. This is almost, in a funny way, the weakest claim you know, from a case law point of view. I don't think it's a weak claim legally. But such linkage has been criticized by numerous independent outside authorities, 
including the ABA Standing Committee on Judicial Independence, the National Center for State Courts, the Chief Justice of the United States and the Jiren Reports, the report of a 19, 1976 of a National Commission on Executive, Legislative, and Judicial Salaries, the American College of Trial Lawyers, numerous articles, and you know what else? Even in a brief, the United States Court of Claims in 1977 authored by former Supreme Court Justice Arthur Goldberg and Supreme Court Justice-to-be Stephen Breyer, and which stated in that brief, that brief, he wrote 1977, in fact, any holding that allowed or encouraged Congress to group judges together with political offices for purposes of determining pay levels would pose a very serious threat to that judicial independence that Article Three is designed to maintain. See, I'm even quoting briefs in the Court of Claims, but they're written by Supreme Court Justice and the Supreme Court Justice to me, I think it's a, it's a good quote. What? <laughs> it's not the law, but hopefully someday. All right. Now, I'm not going to discuss other things that c came up. In the, there are all sorts of speech and debate issues, immunity issues, you know, uh, separation of powers issues, which I, which I argued. The speech and debate clause has never been construed to immunize one branch of government to a claim brought by another branch, in this case the independent judiciary. Separation of powers has never been construed as a bar to, to a claim by one branch to another branch. I kept saying our case is unique in that sense. I represent... The, the judicial branch, the unified court system of New York, headed by the chief judge. So traditional speech and debate cases and other cases really don't apply, we claim, in that context. The best short answer to these issues, speech and debate issues and these immunity issues, which have been raised against me, and I'm arguing, has been a legislature has the power of life or death over all the courts and the entire judicial system, unless the legislature can be, compelled, can be compelled by the courts to provide money which is reasonably necessary for the proper functioning and administration of the courts, our entire judicial system can be wiped out, and the legislature can make a mockery of our form of government with its three co-equal branches, the executive, the legislative, and judicial. To put it bluntly another way, if judiciary is being starved to death, and that includes the provision for judicial pay, is the it has the constitutional right and obligation to protect itself, or else our tripart system of government becomes a sham. All right, where do we stand? Four judges brought another case before us, a case called Larrabee. The four judges, they couldn't wait for the chief judge, obviously. The same judge... Judge heard their case. I heard my case a couple of months later. She, you see, Judge K didn't want to sue. Believe me, she didn't want to sue. She retained me, and I went. Met, I met with Governor Spitzer. I met with. I met with Speaker Silver. I met with. I didn't want to sue either, actually. I, I you know, but and it, I never thought I would have to. I really never thought I would have to. It was a big story that I was hired. It didn't scare anybody, but it was a big story that I was hired. And I, I, I know these people, and I met with them, and I pleaded with them, and I made the same arguments, you know. And I figured they would really do it, you know. <laughs> but they didn't do it. So finally, we sued. Anyway, other judges sued first. The judge in that case, which is the same judge in my case, ruled... He only ruled on one issue, linkage, in that case. The other issues weren't really raised, the ones I talked about here. He ruled that linkage is unconstitutional. That's on appeal. That's going to be heard now the week of November 17th in the Intermediate Appellate Court in New York. My case, which I argued, well, what I tried to do in my case, actually, which the judge didn't do, unfortunately, is I asked for an immediate trial. See, I'm used to Delaware. You heard Judge Holland talk about that. <laughs> you heard that big case. He talked about a multi-billion dollar case today. My friend was in that case. Unfortunately, he was on the losing side. But, well, you know, we still have an appeal in Delaware, I guess. You can go fast in Delaware. So why can't we go fast in New York? I said, fine. Give us a trial in three weeks, four weeks. In Delaware, in a multi-billion dollar case, I can get a trial in four weeks. Give us a trial. Let me call the speaker to the stand. Let's, let me ask how much money he makes from... Whites in Luxembourg, the firm he's of counsel. Well, let me, let's call the, I'll call the chief judge to the stand. She can describe, you know, what's happening to the court system. No, let, let's have a trial judge. Well, the, the speakers, the lawyers jumped up and down. Oh, no, it's a show trial. There's no real contested issues of fact. So the judge, you know, who's a, you know, good guy, decent guy, decent man, but he felt, this should be done on motion. So we did it on motion. So I argued a motion, cross motions in effect for summary judgment on July 17th. I made the linkage argument also, which is, but I, but I argued two other issues, constitutional um, inadequacy and unconstitutional discrimination. That case is not yet decided. If he doesn't decide it by what we intend to do is to file an amicus brief in the Larrabee case, raise all these other issues. And I hope to be making a similar kind of argument as I made today, the week of November 17th. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Mr. Nussbaum. Um, I'm going to open it up for questions, but I, I've got the first one. Um, one of the things that is apparent in, in both of uh, the federal and the, uh, the state case is um, how the linkage between judicial and legislative salaries is an impediment to legislative action to, uh, to raise judicial salary. My question to both of you is how important is the executive role? And is the fact that in New York there has been a bit of a revolving door in Albany, uh, has that been one of the impediments to obtaining a salary increase through legislative means? What happened in New York, let me just tell you what happened in New York. Every governor supported an increase. But the legislature says we're not going to increase unless you support an increase for us. The governors have said, yes, we'll allow you to increase also, but I want to tie it to campaign finance reform, or I want to tie it to some other issue. So you get involved in the circle. He, he, for, in order for the legislature to be permitted to raise his salary, the governor wants something from them. And in order to get the judges, you know, the legislature insists it be raised. So you get into the circle of, of, of argument and things like that. Judicial branch is tied to these other unrelated issues, and nothing happens. It just doesn't go up. They fight, they fight, they fight with each other, and it doesn't go up. And the judges are being held hostage. That's what's happening in New York. The judges are being held hostage to other considerations. In the federal system, ironically, the executive branch has been delinked. There are scores and scores of executive employees who earn far more than federal judges. The only linkage is between Congress and the judiciary, and that, I think it's fair to say, has been Congress's choice. It really hasn't been an executive policy in terms, at least of the recent past, and the uh, president's support for a pay increase. But the executive branch is delinked. The only linkage is Congress and the judiciary. How important has executive involvement been from an advocacy standpoint? Executive involvement is... is, is <laughs> The executive, is, it's very important, except they don't deliver on their promises. You know, they, now, of course, they'll say, yeah, we would have raised judges' salaries, if, but the legislature also wants an increase, and we don't want, we don't want to do that politically, and we don't, we don't want to do that unless we get something for it. So, yes, executive involvement's important, but the legislature also has to come along, and they keep prostrating with each other, and they keep holding the judges hostages, as I said, and nothing gets done. And that's why we've really reached, I think, my, my little uh, uh, you know, vigorous remarks, uh, we've really reached a constitutional crisis. You know, I think there's a real constitutional crisis here, as, as great as some of the other crises we've faced in, the, in our past, and I think the courts have to do something. I think the New York, I'm going to try to go to the New York Court of Appeals and try to get them to do it. Now, you say, how can judges, by the way, this th th normally comes up, how can judges decide this? Well, there's something called the rule of necessity. If everybody's disqualified, the court's still entitled to sit. That's, that's a principle that goes back 500 years to the Chancellor of Oxford. You know, I've, we research, you know, a judge will have to, and plus, sorry, some judges have ruled against this. There's a judge in New York State, there's another case in the third department in upstate New York who's ruled negative on, on, on some of these issues. It's not that the judge can't decide it fairly. You either agree as a constitutional crisis crisis and a constitutional violation, or well, you don't. If you agree, you should decide it the way I say you should decide it. If you don't, decide it the other way. But you have an obligation to decide it. To answer Merle's question, for the federal side, I don't think in this political climate that the executive branch really can have an influential role in persuading the Congress to make a change like this. It might even be counterproductive. So it's been more of a neutral element, I would say, in the recent past. Do federal judges want a lawyer to represent them in this? <laughs> Bring a kid. Yes. Uh, I'm interested in, in the New York case in uh, the form of relief. Uh, I'm asking. Imagine that you, know. you'll, you will. Uh, an injunction against some officer or set of yes. officers that would be enforced? Yes, 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 that's what I'm seeking. I'm seeking a mandatory injunction requiring the state to pay. We, we, we decided not to sue the controller. We figured it's like get a judgment against the state in effect or an injunction against the state. Yeah, I'm seeking that ultimately. We thought about, a lot about that, and it, and it does present problems. I'm not suggesting none of this. This, this is sort of, while I have precedent for the pr principles I'm, I'm arguing, I mean, the relief would be someone unprecedented, at least with respect to salaries. Other states, as I said in my talk, have ordered the state to pay monies out of the Treasury for judicial funding and various issues like that. I'm one of them, but I, uh, uh, so, so is it against named defendants or against the, the state in some No, I, the, off, 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 we sued the state, but we also sued the governor and the leaders of the legislature, and we sued each house. Two quick, two quick questions. 
One is, what was the political negotiation that resulted in the federal judges being linked to congressional pay? What, 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 was the, what brought that about? There's, there's no law that says linkage. It's really more of a practice or custom, and the study that was done by Brookings AEI showed that there's really quite a variation. There have been times over the last 40 to 50 years when there wasn't linkage and there was linkage. Uh, if Russell is here, he can tell us how far back the current linkage goes. I think it goes, yes, Russell, do you remember how long, far back it goes? It's in the uh, 18, 19, 18, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19. The linkage goes back to, as you say, 100 years, but it's uneven. There is a statutory mandate to this the Quadrennial Commission. Yeah, the, what, I don't know whether you heard what he said, but he was saying that in in night. Oh, sorry. The language, because that was the only way to get the judges a pay raise. Uh, we finally broke the linkage this time. I think that what you have to recognize, there's a bill on the floor of the Senate, and there's a bill on the floor of the House, which are identical with respect to the amount of raise and everything else. And the only difference is that in the Senate bill, there's a fine goal too, which says that if a judge goes abroad, he or she can't be reimbursed more than two thousand dollars. The last time I went from Heathrow to London, it cost me 150 bucks to get in. So, I mean, <laughs> just ridiculous. Uh, and it so happens that the head of the Senate, the minority of the Senate, the number two and the number three people of the House say they will do this. The only person I haven't been able to see is the Speaker of the House. Now, if some of you know how to get me to see her today, we may get this done for you tonight. Uh, the one thing I won't tell her that when her grandfather was the mayor of Baltimore, our Secretary of Transportation gave him the money to build that subway. <laughs> It was added initially to an appropriations regulation. I think uh, uh, the fairness of the description says, would say that it came because of a court case in which everybody got a COLA and Congress decided to repeal it after it went into effect and discovered that it couldn't repeal the judge's COLA because of the Constitution. Being very upset with that, they were convinced they would never let that happen again, and so we now have what's commonly known as Section 140, which says federal judiciary cannot get a COLA unless Congress first votes for it. And that happened, I believe, in the early 90s. From an advocacy perspective, what would you ask the people in this room to do about judicial salaries? What what can what can we all do to help? Well, let, let me just say first of all, the the assistance that we've had from the justices of the Supreme Court in terms of testifying before the House Judiciary Committee and the Senate Judiciary Committee in terms of making calls, the support we've had from the news media across the country by editorials and op-op op editorials have been phenomenal. But as I said earlier, there has to be a reason for Congress to vote for this. We've all seen in the past few days what the business community can do if it decides something is important to get it done. The question is, how important is this? The judges don't have the political clout to do it. It's going to depend upon other members of society who conclude that the judiciary is important to the rule of law, to a sound economy, impartial judging. It's up to you folks. Well, I tell you, um, the business community in New York has been very supportive of raising judicial salaries for all the reasons you heard in the panels and we. But the legislature is sort of immovable. The press has been supportive. The Times have blasted the speaker. Just immovable. Very interesting what's happening. And that's why I can't, you know, as I said in my talk, I didn't believe I'd ever have to sue. That's why I'm going to believe that ultimately the only way we're going to have to get a judicial increase in New York is to get a judgment, however crazy that sounds. We're going to get a judgment one of these days. And I think that may, you know, break the logjam. 
in effect. That may take the monkey off their back. And I, it's, it's, reached, it's reached that point. And I don't know if it's reached that point on a federal level, but I, um, it, may, it may reach that point. Well, thank you all very much. At 2 o'clock are the small group sessions. Thank you. Thanks, Ralph. Good job. Thank you. I think it was a little too hot. No, it was great. I need a little energy at lunch. It was good. Warm up here, isn't it? Yes, I thought it, it might just be.